Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to uh, be here and see you this morning. Uh, and the topic that we're going to be speaking about today is a topic that is absolutely essential for Christian living. It's absolutely essential. If we want to be fruitful, if we want to be effective in our Christian walk, then this is a key. If, if it's something that we want to do to, to grow in our faith and to grow in our knowledge and our understanding of who God is and, and all that he's done for us, then this is, this is the key. If we want to grow in our prayer life, if we want to grow in sharing our faith with others, if we want to be used by God to bring healing, to bring transformation, to bring comfort into people's lives, then this is the key. This topic is absolutely key for effective fruitful Christian living, because we desperately need the Holy Spirit. We desperately need the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to be thinking about today. What do we believe about the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? Um, and, and, and what does the Holy Spirit want um, to do through and in us? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, I wonder if any of you have ever um, had to produce a CV Maybe when you've applied for a job, uh, you have to send in a CV, and you put down on your CV a little bit about your background, who you are, um, your educational experience, your work experience, um, something about any special skills or abilities that you might have, uh, and you send them in to the uh, potential employer to give them an idea of who you are and what you might have to offer. Well, today we're gonna be imagining if the Holy Spirit had to produce a CV, what would it look like? So you can see on the screen here, uh, the Holy Spirit's CV. Well, the first thing I think that we would notice if we got to look at the Holy Spirit's CV is that there wouldn't be a profile picture. There wouldn't be a picture on there. Because if we think about God the Father, it probably immediately conjures up an image in our minds. You know, we have a picture of what a father figure looks like. Maybe uh, for some of you, you can see that picture, uh, the famous painting of the prodigal son coming and being embraced by the father. So we have some kind of image of what a father is and what a father looks like. If I say Jesus to you, immediately you have a picture in your mind. Maybe it's one of those pictures that you saw as a child in one of those um, illustrated Sunday school Bible story books. Maybe it's a picture from a TV series or a movie but we have an image in our mind of what Jesus might look like. Now, I'm not saying that those images are accurate, but at least we can picture, we have some kind of image. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, he can seem very anonymous. It's very hard for us to grasp or get a picture in our mind of who is the Holy Spirit. And I actually think that there's a good reason for that. There's a reason, you see, because the Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself. He never draws attention to himself. He's always directing our gaze towards Jesus or towards God the Father. He's always pointing our, direct, our gaze, our focus away from himself and towards Jesus. He's kind of like if you imagine a family gathering, um, you get the photos back and there's one person in the family who's never in the pictures because that's the person who's always taking the pictures and that, I think, is the Holy Spirit. He's like always drawing our attention and pointing towards the others, but we find him hard to picture ourselves. Jesus said something like this to his disciples. He said about the Holy Spirit, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So Jesus is telling us that the Holy Spirit hears from the Father and passes that on to us, and he brings glory to the Son, but he never draws attention to himself. So we find him hard to picture, but that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is not a person. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is like some kind of impersonal force or energy or power. The Holy Spirit is a person even though we can't picture him very easily. Now, I was um, a big fan of Star Wars growing up. Uh, the third movie, Return of the Jedi, it'll always be the third one in my mind, 
Um, that came out when I was five years old. So you can imagine uh, myself and my brother, uh, we had all the toys. We used to pretend to be Jedi Knights, uh, try and control things using the Force. Um, and and uh, that's a big part of my childhood. But we mustn't ever make the mistake of thinking that the Holy Spirit is like the Force, like this kind of power that we can learn to use and control for our own needs. The Holy Spirit is not a, a force. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit is a person. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit speaks, that the Holy Spirit guides, he comforts, he helps, he intercedes for us. These are all things that a person does, not an impersonal force. So the Holy Spirit is a person. We can't control him like a force, but we can resist him. It tells us in the Bible, Stephen, um, in the book of Acts, when he um, got up to speak um, to the high priest and to the, the teachers of the law, one of the things that he accused them of was this. He said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. You always resist the Holy Spirit. So God the Holy Spirit can't be controlled by us, but that doesn't mean that he controls us. So we can't control him, but he refuses to control us. He doesn't force us. We have to choose to cooperate with him or to resist him. So we can resist the Holy Spirit because he will not compel us or force us to do something. So the Holy Spirit can be resisted and also he can be grieved. It tells us in the Bible, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and says this, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. And how do we ensure that we don't grieve him? You can see this um, verse on the screen. Um, how do we ensure that we don't um, uh, grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, it's, uh, Paul goes on to write this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, um, along with every form of malice. So we can grieve the Holy Spirit with those kind of behaviors. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we're disobedient. It's our sin that grieves the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a person. He's fully God, third person of the Trinity, equal with God the Father and God the Son. He's not a force that we can control. We can resist him, but we can also grieve him. So we know a little bit about who the Holy Spirit is. What does he do? What does he do? Well, I want to think of just four things that the Holy Spirit does in us and in the church. And it's not an exhaustive list. I'm sure there's loads of other things that you could add to this, but I want to think particularly uh, this morning about four things. So firstly, the Holy Spirit gives us life. The Holy Spirit gives us new life. You remember that uh, time where Jesus met with Nicodemus, the Pharisee. G uh, the Pharisee Nicodemus com comes to Jesus in the nighttime and he asks Jesus questions. And one of the things that Jesus said to Nicodemus was this, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. You can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and the spirit. So when we come to Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit. We're born into new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. He gives us new birth. But, and here's the key thing to remember, that life-giving role of the Holy Spirit doesn't begin and end when we're converted. It doesn't, it's not a one-time event that happens at the moment that you become a Christian. We need to continually receive from the Holy Spirit to sustain that new life in us. We're not supposed to be filled once and then go on uh, the rest of our lives, but we go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul tells the church in Ephesus to go on being filled with the Spirit. He says this to them, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled. And that word that he uses for be filled is like continue, go on being filled. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. 
And Paul here is speaking to believers, people who have already come to faith, followers of Jesus, but he says to them that they need to go on being filled. They, they need that as a continuous filling of the Holy Spirit to sustain that new life that has begun in them. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, I think God wants us to be thirsty for more. Because there are times in all of our Christian lives when we feel dry, when we feel like things have become a bit stale, and we feel distant from God. And in those times, we're encouraged to come back to God and say, I need more. I need to be refilled. Please refill me again with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus gives us this promise in Luke chapter 11. He says, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God wants us to ask for more, and he is always willing to give more of the Holy Spirit. Christians throughout church history can testify to the truth of that. You can read um, accounts of time and time again when Christians throughout church history have experienced the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. And the result of that is often that their faith comes alive in a new way. It's that they gain a new passion for Jesus, because remember, the Holy Spirit always points our gaze towards Jesus. They gain a new desire to share their faith, and they often gain a new anointing, a new effectiveness in their ministry, maybe throughout the, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These people were already Christians. They'd already come to faith, and yet uh, they received a fresh infilling of the Spirit. So we're to go on being filled. And many of us here, we've experienced something of that for ourselves. Um, I can think of times myself where I've been in a church service and I've just felt the presence of God in a really special way, a way that I haven't felt before. And when I was in that, in that place, that I just felt the Holy Spirit was filling me. And sometimes that can be experienced in different ways. For me, sometimes I feel almost like a weight on my chest, like there's a presence there. And I feel like the presence of God and the Holy Spirit is filling me. But you can have those experiences of God's presence and then you go home and you go to work um, and uh, you get stuck in a traffic jam and over time it just seems to sort of drift away um, and that feeling, that passion, that fire that you had uh, when you were being filled with the Holy Spirit just seems to kind of diminish. And I think there are a number of reasons why that happens. Firstly, to a certain degree, as we've said, we all resist the Holy Spirit you know, the Holy Spirit wants to do things in our lives, and sometimes we cooperate him, with him to a degree, and sometimes we kind of resist. So as we resist, maybe that fire diminishes a little bit. We also grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, none of us are perfect, and as we sin and as we disobey God, we grieve the Holy Spirit, and over time that fire just diminishes a little bit more. But I think there are also uh, just a, a normal rhythm whereby we are filled with God, with the Holy Spirit, and then we go out and we serve God, we, we give it away, uh, we minister to other people, and, and we end up feeling drained by doing that. And we need to come back to God then to be refilled, because we've resisted, because we've grieved him, and also because we've given him away to others. And we need to come back for that refilling. And I think actually, that is part of what it means to be in relationship with God. It's not just a one-time thing. God wants us to keep coming back, to keep coming into his presence, and to say, God, I want more. I want more of you. I want to receive from you again. It's not supposed to be a one-time thing. It's a relationship. Uh, the famous evangelist D.L. Moody, you may have heard of him or read some of his, uh, uh, I've read his biography, but... Um, he was an American uh, evangelist who, who led massive uh, revivals um, in his time. And one of the things that he was asked was why he kept praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He kept on and on and on praying that again he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And somebody asked him, why do you do that? And his answer was this, simply because I leak. I need to be filled again with the Holy Spirit because I leak. And that's the truth for us as well. So if you're a Christian here today, 
then the Holy Spirit lives in you. It's through the Holy Spirit that you came to new birth. But it's not a one-off thing. It's a, it's a relationship, coming back to God, asking for more, asking to be filled again and again and again because we leak, we leak. Secondly, the Holy Spirit gets us in shape. And that, the first point was longer than the other ones. So these other ones are not going to be quite as long. So the first, secondly, the Holy Spirit gets us in shape. I think sometimes there's a perception that there are two types of Christians. Uh, the idea that there are those who put their emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit. They love all of that stuff, all that lively worship and uh, raising their hands and the gifts of the Spirit and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's these kind of Christians who, who are into the Holy Spirit. And then there are Christians who are really into the Word. They love the Bible and they like to study and to read the Bible and listen to podcasts and lectures about, um, about theology. And the, the, there is almost like you, you know, you're one or you're, or you're the other. But actually that distinction doesn't work in practice. Because if we take the Holy Spirit seriously, then we will also take the Word of God seriously. If we take the Holy Spirit seriously, we'll take the word of God seriously because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He wants to guide us into all truth. And actually, on the other side, if we take the word of God seriously, then we'll take the Holy Spirit seriously because the the word of God is full of stories of the impact and the work of the Holy Spirit. So if we take the word seriously, we've got to embrace the spirit But equally, if we embrace the Spirit, he will drive us towards the Word. Because the Holy Spirit wants to get us in shape. He wants to lead us to a deeper understanding and knowledge of the truth, the truth of God and the truth of the Gospel. I remember uh, once taking a group of young people on a youth weekend. um, And uh, it was a time of teaching and worship. And there was one evening where uh, we had a time of worship and it was really clear that the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit just fell in the room and there was a real sense of the presence of God. And and everybody, because of that, everybody just wanted to stay in the room. Um, And so we were all in that room together uh, with a group of teenagers and then some of us who were kind of volunteer leaders. And as I looked around the room, every single one of those teenagers had picked up their Bible and was reading their Bible. It was almost as if, as the Holy Spirit came on them, it made them want to look at the Word, made them want to open their Bibles. So the Holy Spirit is not just about giving us experiences or good feelings, but he wants to shape our minds and our character through the truth of the Word. He wants us to become more like Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us become more like Jesus. And that's where those fruits of the Spirit comes in that we read about in the book of Galatians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those fruits of the Spirit um, that uh, if we're continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit, one of the outcomes of that is that we should see these fruits growing in our lives. The more and more we come back to God and ask for the filling of the Spirit, the more and more we see the evidence of the fruits of the Spirit. So the Spirit gets us in shape. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit gives us power. The Holy Spirit gives us power. And we come to that reading that we heard in Acts chapter 1. It it takes place after Jesus' uh, resurrection. And he appears to his disciples and to his followers uh, on a number of different occasions. On this occasion, they're eating together, and Jesus appears to his disciples, and he's teaching them. Um, And those early Christians, those disciples who had gathered together at that time, they'd spent three years traveling with Jesus. They'd heard his teaching. They'd seen him perform miracles. Uh, They knew that he died on the cross. And now they'd seen the the resurrected Jesus in person. Okay? So we might think to ourselves, well, surely they're ready to go. They've had the training They've got all they need. They're ready to go out on mission and spread the word. But no, Jesus says, wait, wait. There's something more. There's still something that you're lacking. Wait for the gift that my father promised. In a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
You see, they had all the experience and they had the training, they had the knowledge, they'd seen what Jesus had done, but what they didn't have yet was the power. And that's what Jesus wanted them to wait for. Wait for the Holy Spirit, the gift my Father promised, because that's where the power will be. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. But the disciples still don't really get it, and they say to Jesus, is this the time, Jesus? Is this the moment that you're going to restore Israel? You're going to become king and get rid of the Romans and all of that kind of stuff? And Jesus is like, look, don't worry about the timing of all of that. You will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. You see, the shocking news for the disciples is that Jesus isn't going to hang around and do it for them. He promised that he would equip them to do the work of God. He was going to give them power to be the witnesses, to continue the work that Jesus had begun. The disciples were hoping that Jesus was going to hang around and do it all, and they could just watch on the sidelines, cheering him on. But actually, Jesus tells them, no, you're going to receive power. You're going to be my witnesses. People like us, people like me and people like you, get to do the stuff that Jesus did. We get to be his witnesses, to do the stuff that Jesus did, to continue his mission in the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul lists um, in 1 Corinthians some of the ways in which the Holy Spirit's power is shown amongst us in in the church, some of the ways that, that his power is manifested amongst us. And I don't think, again, that's not an exhaustive list. There are other ways, but Paul lists some of the ways um, that the Spirit is manifest. And he says this, in 1 Corinthians 12, to each one the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. And those are things like wisdom, words of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. Now we could probably have a whole sermon series just going through each of the gifts of the Spirit, but we're not going to do that, Uh, not right now anyway. Um, but what we need to know for now about the gifts of the Holy Spirit is firstly that, uh, that God gives gifts to each of us. God gives gifts to each of us. They're not a mark of a super spiritual Christian. They're for everyone. So each is given gifts for the common good. They're not gifts to make somebody look special. They're not gifts for the superstar. They're for the common good. They're for serving and encouraging others. And it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter whether you feel worthy. Because God can work through us if we ask for and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. God can work through any of us. Now, when I was um, at primary school, I was friends with a boy called Richard Larkham. Richard Larkham, uh, his mum was a lady called Jennifer Rees Larkham. And uh, Jennifer was in a wheelchair. And the main thing that I remember about Jennifer Rees Larkham, I think I only met her maybe on one or two occasions, but the main thing I remember about her is that her wheelchair was an electric one. And it had a little joystick that you could control it. And Richard used to love riding on her wheelchair. So he used to sit on her wheelchair and he used to steer it with the little joystick. Um, And I remember one time I met um, Jennifer with Richard and I got to sit on the wheelchair. So I sat on one arm, Richard sat on the other and he kind of steered us around. We went for a ride. Um, But Jennifer was also a Christian author. Um, And so she was kind of well known in the local town. Um, I didn't really know her, I I knew her son, but I've since read her story. Um, And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Jennifer's story. Basically, she had attacks of encephalitis, um, and that's what caused her to be in a wheelchair. She was in a lot of pain. Um, She became extremely weak, um, and she was unable to stand or walk uh, for any kind of length or or, or distance. Um, So she had to use that wheelchair to get around. And she says in her book that the reason she got an electric one is because she didn't have the strength in her arms to push the wheels around, so she had uh, that little joystick. And she'd been in that situation for about eight years. And during that time, she wrote a lot of books. Uh, She was in demand as a speaker, and she used to travel around to Christian events. And she'd come to terms with the fact that God was using her as a disabled woman. She'd come to terms with that. But one day, she was speaking at an event, 
Uh, and there was a lady in the front row, and this was a, a lady called Wendy. She was about 20 years old. Um, and they were just breaking for lunch, and they had a Q&A session. Um, and in the Q&A, Wendy said, in front of everyone, she said, this has never happened to me before, but I think God is telling me to tell you that you're going to get well. And she said that, and everyone was a bit, like, taken aback. Um, and they didn't really know what to do. And so the kind of the worship band quickly came back up and played a song. And, you know, and, and it kind of, they went to the coffee time. But Jennifer went to find this woman, Wendy, and said, will, will you pray for me? And Wendy said, no, no, I can't. Um, I, I've only been a Christian for just under a year. Um, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I wouldn't know how to pray. And so Wendy rushed off to find one of the church leaders um, and so she did. She found one of the church leaders, and to their credit, they said, no, I'm not going to pray for Jennifer. Wendy, you felt that God was speaking to you. You should do it. You need to go and pray for her. So Wendy went back, and she found Jennifer, and um, she prayed for her. She didn't really know what to say. She just said a very simple prayer, Jesus, make Jennifer well, something like that. And Jennifer describes in her book that as soon as she'd been prayed for, she could feel that something had changed. She could feel that when she moved in her chair, she wasn't stiff anymore. You know, it used to be that if she'd been sitting in the wheelchair for a long time, you know, it would take her ages and ages to kind of, uh, her muscles would have like tensed up and she couldn't move. But she was just, there was freedom. She could stand up easily. Um, and she was completely healed. She was completely healed. And you can see a picture here, um, which appeared in our local newspaper. So our, because she was kind of known in the area, you know, she was, she'd written some books, so she actually uh, was in our local newspaper holding her wheelchair above her head. And I don't think that's the electric one. I, think, I guess the electric one was still too heavy for her to lift. <laughs> but she was completely healed, and she's written a book about that. It's called Unexpected Healing. Um, and I've got a copy at home. I'd, I'd lend it to you if anyone is interested to read that. Um, but this, the thing that's amazing... And it's amazing, this amazing story uh, of healing. But one of the things that I want us to take away from that today is that the person that God used to, to bring that healing was a lady who had only just really become a Christian, didn't really feel that she was worthy, didn't feel that she had a gift of healing, didn't feel like she had any wise words and clever theology to pray a great prayer, but she just stepped out in faith, believing, well, look, if God can use me, then I'm willing to step out and try. And she tried, and God acted in power. God gives us power by the Holy Spirit, not through us, not through anything special in ourselves. It's the Holy Spirit, and we need that power. We need that power. And that's why the disciples had to wait, because they would have been totally ineffective without that power. They might have known and been able to tell some stories about Jesus. They might have been able to repeat his teaching. But without that power of the Holy Spirit, they couldn't make a difference in the lives of the people that Jesus was sending them to. Lastly, the Holy Spirit sends us out. Why did Jesus promise the Holy Spirit? Why did the Father send the Holy Spirit? Ultimately, it's not just uh, for our good experience but it's to equip the church for mission. He wants to equip us for mission, to send us out. Jesus said when the disciples asked him if he was going to restore Israel, he said, you will be my witnesses. He was equipping them to do the work in the world, not just in Jerusalem, but in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's the Holy Spirit that comes to equip us to be witnesses to do the mission of God in God's world, to share the good news of the gospel, to pray for healing, to pray for miracles, to pray for transformation. You don't have to go and fetch a church leader. You can pray for healing, for miracles, for transformation. You can do it because it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that these things can happen. We don't receive the Holy Spirit so that we can selfishly keep the Holy Spirit to ourselves, like we'll have a great time here in church, uh, celebrating and receiving and being filled with the Holy Spirit. No, we're filled with the Holy Spirit so we can go out there and take that gift with us in a world that needs to know God's touch. What the world needs 
is a church filled with the Holy Spirit. What Craiger needs is Mount Merion filled with the Holy Spirit because it's only by the Spirit's power that we can do God's mission in God's way.